In April of this year, the U.S. Navy reached an agreement with Newport News Shipbuilding to prepare for the dismantling of the Nimitz aircraft carrier ahead of schedule. And during this time, the U.S. Navy began planning how to dismantle the Nimitz, unload the nuclear reactor and fuel, and add them to the disposal. The U.S. Navy has now reached out to the experienced Newport News shipyard to establish the requirements. However, just as they and the shipbuilder were beginning to examine how to safely decommission and dismantle the Nimitz, the USS Enterprise, CVN-65, which was decommissioned in 2012, is still being dismantled. Are aircraft carriers that difficult to dismantle? The previous aircraft carrier, the USS Coral Sea, lasted seven years, and now the USS Enterprise, which is still being dismantled to this day. The aircraft carrier USS Coral Sea started construction at the end of World War II and was commissioned in 1947. The USS Enterprise, CVN-65, on the other hand, was the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier for the US Navy and the world. They are so difficult and slow to dismantle for a common reason, no one wants them. As long as you undertake the task of dismantling it, there will definitely be costs involved. The steel plates on the carriers alone have to be hired as workers, piece by piece, to cut them down. It is estimated that dismantling an aircraft carrier will cost at least $65 million. It is both time-consuming and labor-intensive, and the key is to keep an eye on the cost. And in the case of being urged by the A-side to increase the investment in manpower, that cost more. So the United States now has 80,000 tons of aircraft carrier dismantling tasks, basically none of which shipbreaking yards dare to take. Like the Coral Sea aircraft carrier, there is no one to push the work forward. In order to preserve the profit, the dismantling of the Coral Sea carrier took seven years to complete. The enterprise was not so lucky. First of all, it dismantled the steel, and parts cannot be sold like scrap. The whole process of dismantling is to be supervised by the U.S. Navy, and the destination of all the dismantled stuff will be tracked. Second, its nuclear reactor is a hot potato that must be dealt with in a unique location. That's why the Enterprise has not been dismantled until now, so how do you perfectly dismantle the aircraft carrier? Dismantling an aircraft carrier is a technical task. In this episode, we will learn how to dismantle an aircraft carrier from both structure and experience. After World War II, the United States developed five types of aircraft carriers, Forrestal, Kitty Hawk, Enterprise, Nimitz, and Ford. So if you want to dismantle them well, how can you do it without understanding their structure? For example, the Kitty Hawk class, as a representative model between conventional and nuclear power, is the most suitable example. The Kitty Hawk class carrier is a super-optimized version of the Forrestal class carriers, which are basically the same in appearance but with an increase in tonnage of 4,000 tons to 83,090 tons, making it the largest conventionally powered carrier in the world. It has 10 layers, from the keel at the bottom of the ship to the flight deck. Counting from the bottom to the top, the first level is the fuel and fresh water tanks, the second to fourth levels are the main engine room, the boiler room, the secondary engine room, and the ammunition room for the ship's aircraft and on the fifth level are the soldiers living quarters, the food room. On the sixth floor, there are various canteens and living quarters, the seventh floor is the aircraft repair depot, and the last eight to ten floors are mostly hangars, while the rest are infrastructure such as duty rooms and pilots' messes. The height of each floor is about 2.4 to 2.8 meters. The largest space in the main hull and the largest compartment in the carrier is the hangar for the warplanes, which often takes up two to three decks of space. Its height also varies slightly depending on the aircraft on board. As for the aircraft carrier's armory, it is filled with ammunition for all the ship's weapon systems and is generally located below the waterline. In terms of layout, the Kitty Hawk class is very similar to the Enterprise, Nimitz, and Ford classes that followed. For example, the Kitty Hawk class has built a total of four ships so far, but in the process, the U.S. built the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the Enterprise. After the Kitty Hawk class had built two ships, the Enterprise was built, so they both have a similar configuration, except that the power was replaced with nuclear power. The Nimitz and Ford, which followed, apparently borrowed some of the construction features of the Kitty Hawk class. It can even be said that the development of aircraft carriers was basically set after the British invented the angled deck carrier. 
So what is the difference between the Kitty Hawk class and the Enterprise, Nimitz, and Ford? First of all, the biggest difference is the power source. Of course, this is known to everyone, but what about being more specific? On a conventionally powered carrier, the carrier's engines would be in separate compartments. But nuclear-powered carriers, such as the Nimitz and Ford-class aircraft, need to free up compartments to put the reactor and protection box. So the original compartment became two engines crammed into one compartment. The next is the island and internal structure changes, especially after the collection of the Kitty Hawk-class damage test. The United States will be the Ford-class modified to an extreme. For example, as can be seen from the joint exercise footage once released by the U.S. Navy of the USS Truman and USS Ford, the two carriers differ in many ways in their appearance. First of all, the Ford-class carriers, due to their late birth, have more advanced technology for the integration of electronic equipment in their islands. It is able to do more information exchange than the Nimitz-class carriers with a smaller volume of equipment. For example, the Ford's active electronically scanned array and dual-band radar technology can scan 360 degrees to search for all hostile targets within a circular range, saying goodbye to the old era of rotating search radar. The second, smaller island also allows the Ford-class carriers to utilize a further increase in flight deck area. This is very advantageous for a weapon that relies primarily on ship-based aircraft to strike the enemy. For example, the Truman Island in the exercise was significantly larger than the Ford's, taking up more of the flight deck area. And the island is located more forward, which is not conducive to the effective use of the forward flight deck area. Although the Ford has one less elevator than the Truman, the optimized layout makes the ship's aircraft more efficient. According to U.S. Navy tests, the Ford carrier with the new elevator design has a 25% higher single-day aircraft availability than the Nimitz-class carriers. Finally, the Ford also has space reserved in the stern of the hull for future shipboard weapons, which can later be loaded with those US laser, electromagnetic, missile drogue systems, and other advanced weapons. And these are the areas that should be focused on when dismantling the Nimitz. The aircraft carrier USS Coral Sea was decommissioned from the US Navy and, after removing valuable equipment from the ship, was sold to Sea Witch Salvage in 1993 and eventually dismantled for recycling as scrap metal. The dismantling process was from top to bottom, from the deck to the bottom compartment, like peeling an onion, layer by layer. The first to be dismantled was the flight deck of the Coral Sea. Since the Midway class was the first US aircraft carrier to be equipped with an armored flight deck, the dismantling process was more laborious than that of the old aircraft carriers. However, it should be noted that during the whole dismantling process, you will find that the angled deck of the Coral Sea and the flight deck of the bow were removed last. The reason for this is to ensure the balance of the ship during the dismantling process. Thus, it can be seen that the demolition of old ships inside requires very deep knowledge. It is necessary to follow the steps. The structural strength and balance of the hull must be taken into account to avoid accidents. Moreover, the dismantled hull must meet certain specifications and be cut squarely by machinery before further dismantling and recycling. At the same time, it is also necessary to do a good job of handling harmful substances on the hull to avoid harm to the environment and staff. So if you want to dismantle the Nimitz aircraft carrier, you have to remove the reactor and then take radiation measurements to dismantle it. The whole process is more tedious without having to think about it, and the cost is definitely more expensive. This is because the nuclear reactor fuel has to be removed, the water in the piping system and water tanks has to be drained, the radioactive system has to be sealed, and the reactor compartment has to be sealed and filled with highly sealed tanks. It would then be transferred to a dedicated storage tank for permanent storage. This cost is already high, and there is also the storage of the core, which is another significant annual cost. Of course, sinking the aircraft carrier, like the USS America, is another simpler way to dismantle it. However, the US chose to sink the aircraft carrier USS America solely to do damage tests and provide valuable data for the subsequent Nimitz and Ford class carriers. At this point, the entire process of dismantling the Nimitz aircraft carrier is over. If you have the opportunity to dismantle an aircraft carrier, what are you going to do? You are welcome to leave your comments in the comments section, and we will see you next time.